Thanks to, uh, to Sam. Um, I've gotten really good at drawing the diagrams on these slides because I had to draw them over and over and over again and turn them into a presentation. Um, uh, also, uh, it was good to, to see the, the Mojo talk. Uh, I, was in, I, I worked with Ken sort of in the early days of Chrome adopting Mojo. He used my feature as a guinea pig for a lot of how Mojo works. It's completely different now. So now my code is out of date. It's very annoying. Um, OK. so. In the talk that John gave earlier today, um, he introduced a lot of the sort of overall principles about how we organize Chrome, multi-process architecture, services, that kind of thing. What I'd like to do here is, is take some of that content and dive a little deeper um, and really sort of give you a tour through the classes that make up the Chrome, the, the Chrome application so that when you're trying to find some of these things like what is a render frame host? Like you actually know what that is. You can map that to a concept in the UI um, and that'll hopefully like help you sort of like th like think through how Chrome works a, a, a little more easily. Um, so one of the sort of really big divides in the Chromium project is that it is it it, ha it is both the Chrome the Chrome browser Google Chrome browser um, and also a, a library that other applications can use to build their own browser. Um, and you see that with things like Android WebView or the Electron project. They are other embedders of what we call the content layer. So there's this separation between, you, I don't know if you can actually see the laser pointer, uh, content and Chrome. And so Chrome is said to embed content. And so for a lot of the objects I'm going to be talking about here, there are both uh, Chrome <laughs> versions and content versions, where the Chrome version sort of adds more of the Chrome browser product features on top of the core uh, content just rendering, rendering layer. Um, <clears throat> OK. so. Chrome, it's an application like any other application. It has a main function somewhere. When you double click the icon, it starts running code somewhere in that giant binary. Um, <clears throat> and that is inside the browser process. So no matter how many windows or tabs you have open, there's always a single browser process. And that's the parent of everything else, renderers, GPU processes, utility processes. Um, there are a couple of major objects that live in the browser process. Uh, the first one is browser process. Um, one of these gets started is created when the browser starts, and it exists for the whole life of the whole life of the, of the browser. Um, the content layer provides the sort of core browser main loop object, and the, and has sort of an extension mechanism that allows embedders to add other pieces, and that's the browser main parts, which Chrome extends to create uh, Chrome browser main parts. Um, and the reason that I mention these is that one of the things that makes testing easier is avoiding globals, making sure that you actually, like every object really has a well-defined lifetime. And so you may be tempted if you want to have some piece of state that you say, oh, that lives for as long as the process. Well, if you're in a test, you might want to tear it down and start it up over and over and over again. So maybe instead of making it a global, attach it to one of these top-level browser process or Chrome browser main parts classes so that um, you know, it effectively lives, lives forever, but during a test, you can actually start it up and shut it down and make sure that that works as well. Um, so looking at like some pieces of the Chrome UI, uh, one feature that Chrome has is that it allows users to create separate profiles. And these can be used to separate personal and work browsing histories, or if you share your computer with your, with your family, um, you may have different people using the computer at different times. And we created profiles to allow users to be able to share a single computer without getting their data all mixed up. You don't want to have to log your sister out of Gmail just to check your mail. You can just open your profile and leave everything that she was working on alone. Um, profiles work a little differently on different platforms. So this uh, dialog that you see here is what it looks like on uh, desktop platforms like Windows or Mac OS, where you can have uh, multiple profiles active at the same time, and each of them just has their own collection of windows. On Chrome OS, your profile is what you get when you log in. And so uh, everything you see when you log into Chrome OS is your profile, but it actually does have a secret profile switcher function, which until they get rid of it, which apparently they're planning on it, <laughs> um, it's going to, uh, it, 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 it supports sort of a multi desktop uh, mode. Um, another feature of profiles in Chrome is the idea of incognito. So incognito uh, is designed to allow the user to choose that to choose to turn off history for a little while. You know, it doesn't save cookies, it doesn't save browser history, and the way that it does this is it creates an, a special off-the-record profile object. And the off-the-record profile 
has all the same storage APIs that a normal profile does. It provides the same kind of hooks for setting cookies or adding history, but it doesn't actually write any of that to disk. Um, and, the, and so when, when you close the window and the off-the-record profile is deleted, all that data is gone, and it's like it never happened. Um, one of the quirks, though, about how incognito works is that it's actually, it actually still retains a reference back to the original profile. And the reason for this is that when you're in incognito mode, you still want to have your bookmarks. You still want to have it autofill passwords if you want to be able to log into a site. And so there's always a reference from the off-the-record profile back to the real profile. And some features can use that in order to continue to assist the user, even if they are in incognito. But of course, you have to be careful because you don't want to leak user data into the, in, into the incognito window unless you are sort of really sure the user wants you to, like for a, a safe password. Similar to incognito is guest mode. So uh, guest mode is designed for a slightly different use case, uh, where incognito is for uh, sort of turning off history for a second. Guest mode is for if you want to lend your computer to somebody else. And you usually see this mostly on Chrome OS, but it does work on desktop as well. Um, Guest mode you reuses most of the infrastructure from incognito mode, but instead of creating the incognito profile based on your current profile, it basically creates an empty sort of blank throwaway profile and then initializes all the incognito uh, functionality on top of it. So it still doesn't save anything to disk, but it also doesn't retain any of the state from before you went into guest mode. And so it's kind of a fresh, clean slate whenever you start it up. OK, so going back to some other pieces of, of the UI, this I'm sure you're familiar with is what Chrome looks like. Um, but so now that we've talked about some of the main objects, we can, we, we, we can sort of uh, we can, we can actually point, point, point out some things and what, um, what they correspond to. <coughs> so for example, we were talking about profiles. And up here in the corner, we have the profile icon, which indicates which profile that window belongs to. Um, now, uh, so each window, so we talked about the browser process object that is global to the entire browser process. Each window, confusingly, is, 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 re is uh, re uh, represented by a browser object. So when you see browser, a browser object in the code, that doesn't refer to the entire Chrome browser process. That just refers to that particular window. We should probably rename it browser window at some point. Um, I don't want to start that by chip. Um, <laughs> So uh, inside a window, you also have uh, tabs. And there's a class called tab strip model that manages that list, of, that list of tabs that are associated with a particular window. And then we wouldn't be a web browser without web content. And so web content is what gets drawn in the, in the middle of the window. And that's really what we're going to be talking about um, for the rest of the talk. OK, so um, bef but before we do that, Let's just sort of talk about a, a couple more concepts that we often find in the code base, some of them that are, can be kind of confusing. Um, so many features will have per profile data. And it would be a real mess if every feature had to add their own fields to browser context or the profile objects. And this is especially necessary if we, if we want to provide isolation between Chrome and content. Because remember that we provide both this big application that's Chrome, and we also provide this library that other people can use to build their own sort of browser applications. Um, and so we have, we have a couple patterns that are useful for attaching data to existing classes. And one of the classes that most often gets data attached to it is the browser context or the profile. Um, and there are two uh, main patterns for how to do that. Um, the most common is called base supports user data. And the idea is that if you have some data you want to attach to another object like browser context, you have it uh, implement supports user data data. And you can attach it to, to, to the browser context by just calling set user data and giving it a, a key. And then if you later have a browser context and want to see if you've added some data to it before, just call get user data. Um, and this, this makes the, the, the lifetime of your data really easy to reason about because when the browser context gets destroyed, your data gets destroyed. You can check if the data was there. Very easy to manage. Um, slightly more complicated is the keyed service. Um, keyed services. Um, work essentially the same. You attach an object to an existing browser context. Um, but they support kind of a, a two-phase shutdown, where before the object gets destroyed, we first do a pass to say, OK, we want to shut down all these services. And that's useful for things like browser context, because there are so many, um, there's so many interdependencies between things associated with a profile that it's useful to be able to sort of shut down all those relationships first and then destroy the objects. 
Um, but because of that additional complexity, there's actually there's this class called Browser Context Keyed Service Factory. I know it's a mouthful, um, which manages the dependencies and the shut and sort of setting up and tearing down all those objects. So if you see those those, those around, that's what they are. They're a very useful pattern. I remember telling Sam that he needed to use a browser context keyed service and getting a blank look. <laughs> um, OK. So like I said, browser, it's all about web content. So probably one of the most important objects in all of Chrome is web contents. Um, so web contents represents the data that is, it represents a tab. Um, we could call it tab, but we called it web contents. <laughs> um, <laughs> Web Contents demonstrates um, that the reason we don't call it tab is because while all tabs have a Web Contents that is what is drawn in that content area, there are a bunch of things that aren't tabs that are Web Contents. So for example, uh, you can have Web Contents that are in standalone application windows. You can have Web Contents that show up in like pop-up dialogues from extensions and stuff like that. So while you can assume that every tab is Web Contents, not every Web Contents is a tab. Um, Web Contents de demonstrates a number of patterns that you'll see all over the Chrome code base. Um, the first of which is, is that what is that is that user data uh, that user data pattern. So people <laughs> often, in addition to attaching things to browser contexts, people often attach things to web contents, um, and that is a and, and so there's a lot of there are a lot of web contents user data. In Chrome, uh, you'll often found, see these referred to as a tab helper. And the idea is that uh, if you have a feature that needs to store some state related to a tab, you create a web contents user data for that. And it's basically an object that helps out when you're implementing that feature, holding onto the data uh, related to a tab. So you'll see lots of tab helpers for various features, like extensions tab helper and stuff like that. Uh, another pattern that you'll see uh, demonstrated with web contents is the observer pattern. So there are lots of interesting events that can happen to a web contents. It could navigate, it could crash, um, and so there's an observer interface that you can implement in order to get all those, all those uh, events from the web contents. Since tab helpers often want to know when the tab they're helping with has done something interesting, very often a, 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 a web contents user data is also a web contents observer. Uh, the last pattern is, uh, the del is, 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 the, is the delegate or the client. So web contents is a class inside of the content layer. So web contents just knows how to draw content. It doesn't want to have any complicated details about how exactly uh, the browser works. And so it has to call out into, the, in, into Chrome to do things like display a file picker. If you want to upload an attachment to your email, content knows how to upload a, uh, upload a file. It knows how to you know, do all the networking stuff related to that. But it doesn't know how the browser wants to ask the user about the file. So content requires that the, the embedder, in this case Chrome, implement the web contents delegate interface and implement the run file chooser method, which will return whatever file the user picked. Um, and so that's one of the places where uh, we have this, the, the, the interface between content and Chrome uh, as, as an embedder. There are a whole bunch of other ones. Um, oh, the font. OK. So on this side, we have a whole bunch of other classes that are part of the content public interface. Um, and, the, and on this side, we have all, uh, all of the classes that are, in, uh, that are Chrome's implementation of those, of those interfaces. Um, and so you'll see this term client used. The idea is that uh, content has a client. It has the thing that's embedding it. And the client has to implement a bunch of functions in order to provide the, uh, the, in, the, the, the functionality that, 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 that the content depends on. And Chrome is not the only embedder of content in the source tree. So if you look at a class like uh, Content Client, you'll also see an Android WebView Content Client. You'll see a Headless Content Client uh, for other uh, thing, for for uh, for other 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 uh, applications that use uh, content within within them. Okay, um, so. You learned earlier that Chrome is using a multi-process model to separate parsing and rendering and execution of untrusted content from the main browser process. Uh, in order to display that content, the browser creates a frame into which the render process can draw content. Um, so now that we've uh, gotten into this uh, multi-process architecture and we've got all these layers, we sort of have, we have a whole bunch of objects. So bear with me for a second. Um, so uh, content has a the content actually embeds Blink, which is our HTML rendering engine. And so when we create a frame in which to draw web content, first we have a local frame. 
Uh, Blink exposes, ex, uh, exposes its interface to things like content by usually prefixing the class name with web. So there's a web local frame, which is part of the Blink public interface. Um, content owns that in a render frame, which is part of the content public interface. And this all exists inside the render process. Um, this arrow, which I've sort of glossed over, is all the Mojo stuff that uh, Ken and Oksana just talked about. Um, and so the, bra and, and the browser has this render frame host object that, that is the sort of companion to the render frame um, between the, the, the browser and render processes. Um, in IPC, you'll often see, uh, when you have objects on either side of an IPC boundary, in Chrome, you'll often see this host suffix on the, um, the, the, the owning process side. So there will be a render frame host in the browser, which represents a render frame. There'll be a render process host. There'll be a GPU process host. Um, that sort of comes out of the, 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 the semantics of the old IPC system. Um, in in uh, components using Mojo, you'll often see service instead of host, um, though naming does tend to vary, and everybody can call things what they want. Okay, so to, to dive down, to dive a little bit deeper into a, into a more complex example, um, Chrome originally started using multiple renderer processes in order to isolate stability problems um, triggered by one tab from the other tab. So if Gmail starts using too much memory, that tab crashes, all your other tabs are fine. Um, with the launch of site isolation, which I know the security talks are going to go into in more detail tomorrow, um, we've also used the, the multi-process model in order to provide a really good security boundary um, in order to keep code owned by different origins in separate processes. Um, and a different part of that transition, which again we'll be talking about tomorrow, is the introduction of out-of-process iframes. Which might lead you to wonder, okay, what is an iframe? So um, when the browser is rendering a site, so in this example, we have gone to a.com and we've loaded that document. Well, that document contained a couple tags. It contained an, an iframe source uh, a.com tag and an iframe source b.com tag. And what the iframe tag tells the browser to do is create a new content area inside the existing content <laughs> area and load another, uh, another document within that. And because uh, we have this multi-process model and we have site isolation, what we actually are doing behind the scenes, in the UI you see one sort of consistent uh, rendered experience of all of these origins uh, to together. In the background, we've actually created multiple render processes. Um, one render process is handling everything related to a.com, and so we have two frames, both the main content frame and, the, and one of the iframes being rendered by that process. And then in the other process, we have the rendering happening for the other, for the other frame. And what you get with this, sort of, this document and all these iframes is, is a tree, which is called the frame tree where every tab has one main frame, but then you could have sort of arbitrarily nested more uh, additional frames with additional origins. And the, the, one, of the, one of the big pieces of what content does as a library is, figure, is manage all these render processes and figure out what, uh, how, how to render all these documents and how to, how, how to combine them all together into a single, into a single experience. Um, uh, another, another thing, I really need to file a bug about slides and font rendering. <laughs> um, it looks fine on my machine. So um, the, uh, an, 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 another detail, I was just going to do the, 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 the last little detail about profiles. Um, so when I was talking about profiles, we're talking about things like user history, cookies, storage. Um, these are actually split into sort of two categories. Um, in the, the, all of the user's preferences, so things about their, their browsing history, their bookmarks, their saved passwords, those are associated with a profile. However, information about um, the information that, 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 that a website stores, so things like cookies, local storage, index DB, those are actually uh, stored in something called a storage partition. And a storage partition is a concept within content. Um, and the idea of a storage partition, uh, and for the most part, data in a storage partition all ends up in the default. So for a given Profile, you have a default storage partition where all the data and where all the data is stored. But there are a couple of features where we actually want to be able to create sort of isolated um, uh, browsing contexts. Uh, one of the places where this happens is inside of Chrome apps. So a Chrome app can create a web view 
which allows the user to sort of get to, which allows the application to build its own web browser, essentially similar to what Android WebView does for Android applications. Uh, Chrome apps have a WebView tag, which can, can do the same thing. And so since the Chrome app is running under the context of a particular user, that data would go into that user's profile. But since the application is kind of creating its own browser, that web view gets its own storage partition where all of the cookies and storage from sites loaded in that, in, in that web view are stored. And that is my last slide. So I want to thank the folks who, uh, who helped me put together this presentation, uh, Ovidio, who sat through a, uh, a much rougher run through, a run through of this for me yesterday. Uh, John, who is responsible for so much of Chrome's architecture and also helped me, helped me review this, this, this presentation. So I just want to thank them and thank you all for listening and coming today. So I think we have about 10 minutes seven. for questions. Seven. Seven? OK, seven minutes. He wants to let you out early. Um, all right, so any questions? No questions. I was wondering about the definition of a mainframe. Is there one mainframe per web contents, or is there one mainframe per uh, site? Uh, there's one web, one mainframe per web contents. The mainframe is really just kind of the root of the the frame tree. Um, with like site isolation, if you have all these like, you know, xyz.github.io and then something else on github.io, they're actually like different sites, even though they have the same. Um, so I think they're going to go into much more detail on exactly how that works in the security talk tomorrow. Uh, there's based there, there, there's, 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 there's a, I believe that the way that site isolation works is that it, um, it segments things by sort of the, the effective top level domain. So github.com is a single site from that perspective, but there, there are some details over there that I'm not uh, absolutely familiar with. So I think there'll be a lot more detail on that tomorrow. Maybe there's a question back there. So regarding the uh, render frame OS tree, mm -hmm. so how long can it be? Is there any limit where we can restrict it? I don't believe there's a limit. Uh, I think you can create new render frames until you run out of memory. Either that or it's something unreasonable like 64. <laughs> um, so I'm not new to Chrome. I've been on Chrome for a long time. But um, this is a debate that never seems to end, which is, and I would like to ask you to explain in as gruesome a detail as you can the meaning of delegate versus client versus <laughs> proxy. And in particular, why would we call, like, why, why do we use the name web contents delegate rather than just file picker or date picker? In other words, it, it, the, adding delegate there makes it sound like this is something that is. Um, inherently a part of the web contents idea, and it's not. The idea is that it's a file picker or a date picker, which is implemented by the browser. Do you understand? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think I understand. Um, okay. So yeah, so there are, so I think the, the, the first answer um, is that, uh, there, that the English language has lots of words that mean similar things, mm -hmm. and nobody can decide which word is the best one. Um, but I think that I think that there is there there is a like like in the delegate versus client um, naming, for example. Um, I, 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 I the 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 idea in um, in web contents delegate is that web contents as an as an object web contents impl really is delegating to this other class some details of how it's implemented. That's that's sort of my justification for the use of the word delegate. Now it's possible that if it specifically was the method to create a file picker, for example, you could have a web contents delegate method called get file picker. And it'd be completely reasonable for that to return like a std unique pointer file picker that provides the rest of that, inter in that interface. And you wouldn't have to call that file picker delegate. Like you could just call it file picker. Um, I think that client is very is used in a lot of the other cases because um, the Chrome would be considered a client of the content API. And so that's the, inter the interface that the clients have to implement. 
Um, but like I said, most of the, those justifications I came up with while writing this talk and trying to see if I could like come up with a really good reason why that was what these things were called. Um, I think that it's just, you know, certain, it's like the difference between host and like host doesn't make sense anymore, but it used to. Um, we call things services now. Maybe services will make sense. Maybe we'll rename them in, in, a, in a few years. Um, naming is hard. It's, isn't that one of the major problems in computer science, naming things? So a question regarding um, the frame host and then mm -hmm. the frames. We, you briefly touched this before. So I just wanted to uh, uh, clarify. By the uh, figure you had on the screen, it seems like frame ho host uh, oh. kind of owns the render the renderer frame via uh, you know across the processes, right? right? Um, so does it like actually owning it or does it have a pointer to them or not even, it's not even like that kind of ownership. I just want to. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so I, so, and the, the, then I've, I've glossed over a little bit of details and like the exact ownership relationship between render frame and web local frame and local frame. They, they, they're effectively what the, each of those owns the other. Um, but people more familiar with those exact interfaces will probably tell me I'm wrong. There's actually some life cycle involved there. Um, but actually specifically about the render frame host to render frame uh, ownership model, because I think that one's the most interesting. Um, there are a number of ways in which you can do ownership across a mojo pipe. Um, so there often is this concept you'll see of the idea of a pipe owning an object. Um, and the idea there is that you know, the, the render frame host might be connected to the render frame. And if the render frame goes away, then the render frame host can be destroyed as well because those two objects sort of have a shared fate. And because you're across two processes, you, you don't have just, it's not as simple as just, you know, C++ constructors and destructors, but there is still this, this idea of this kind of shared fate between two objects across an IPC channel, where if one is destroyed, the other one won't be destroyed immediately because there's some messages that have to go across the, the channel to tell the other side that something has been has gone away. But yes, they essentially have the same lifetime and they would both be destroyed at roughly the same time. Um, be careful about that roughly the same time thing, though, because there have been a number of, uh, of crash bugs related to the fact that people assume that render frame is, host has been destroyed as soon as the render frame is destroyed, and it's not quite. It's almost. Uh, so the question was, why, was uh, why is this called a local frame? Um, the reason for that is that out-of-process iframe concept. So because in, in, in this example, we have, so we have one frame here that's the, 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 the main frame. And then we have one frame here, which ends up being in the same process. So over in this render process, this frame has a reference to this frame as a local frame. But this frame is reference to this frame as a remote frame because that's in a different process. Um, and it was a big sort of refactoring effort to actually support the concept of supporting all the APIs related to frames and that frame tree relationship when some of the frames weren't actually in the same process. So to tag on to my original question, for, for render process, the, the lower render process there, which one is the main frame there? Uh, in the lower render process, yeah. there is no main frame in that, in, in that render process. So that render process only exists. Um, yeah, the, the, the main frame is a, is a concept about a tab. So that's one of the things that happens when you go from the browser process to the render process. The render process, doesn't ca the render process knows about the frame tree, but it doesn't care as much as the browser process does because it's just drawing into boxes. And it's up to the compositor, like where it puts it, and it's up to the browser process to decide, like what the hierarchy is. So, what would you get if you asked, like, if you call get mainframe on on the render frame down there? Would you get? Um, if you so, there is no get mainframe method in on, on in the render process. Um, the method you get in the render process is there, there is a method on frame that's get parent, and 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 in get parent, like you would be able to get a, a remote reference to the parent frame from the other from the other frame, but. The, the concept of a web contents, the concept of a tab that has a mainframe, um, is a browser process concept. Do we have a web API for uh, the contents of the one of the subframes um, to know that they're not the mainframe? Um, yes. So the um, so th there's some details there that have to do with cross cross origin iframes and whether whether cross origin iframes how much data about each other cross origin iframes get. But let's just we just assume that all the frames were, were same origin. Um, you can ask yourself as a as a document 
uh, who your parent is. And so an iframe can actually walk all the way up the tree to its, its, its most parent, most parent. It's just that if you go cross a cross origin boundary, you get less information about that because we don't we, we allow same origin iframes to actually access each other's variables and do all sorts of stuff, um, whereas cross origin iframes just kind of get to know that that each other exist and that's about it. You mentioned that um, user data is attached to the browser context and. Is it web content or uh, uh, profile? So, profile. so profile inherits from browser context. So, browser context is what content calls a profile, and profile is what Chrome calls a profile. Could you give an example of some of that user data? Um, yes. Yeah, so, in the example, this example here. So, um, your your browser history, your bookmarks, um, sort of like the sort of the user like application information, like the user preferences. All of that is in the profile. Um, and then as a subset of that, you have the, the data stored on behalf of individual applications, and that's what goes into storage partitions. This question in the back. Where does the cache fit, fit in this picture? Um, I think it's in the storage. Yeah, it's in the storage partition. So the, the, the storage partition also includes all of the network context. Um, and so that yeah, that's per storage partition. The cache is actually owned by the network pro the, the network service process, but the connection the e each storage partition gets its own connection to the network service that maintains sort of a separate context for each one. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of questions ago that when you cross like an origin boundary, you get less information about the other neighboring iframes. Is that to is that like security feature to prevent like the cross site request forgery? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So the, yeah, the, the yeah the the idea is the, the idea is that you is that you shouldn't be able to like if you if you embed some some iframe in your page that iframe shouldn't be able to go and read all of the information all of, like you know the, the shouldn't be able to read all of the content of of the of the page that it's embedded in unless the page is embedded and wants it to and then it, there are ways you can pass information so you can opt in to passing information into an iframe but by default they're they're segregated. Where is the secret Chrome OS feature for multiple profiles and why are we getting rid of it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you if you've logged into if you've logged into Chrome OS, if you have multiple user accounts in Chrome OS and you've logged into one and you go into the system menu um, and then click on your profile icon, it will give you an option below that that's like sign in additional profile. Um, I think that that's turning into something that'll look more like the way that uh, desktop uses it, where you just sign in and then you have multiple profiles with multiple windows. Um, so it'll, it'll sort of unify how it works between Chrome OS and other and other platforms. So I was, I was curious about when you sort of cross the, the, the render process boundary, like, you, like if you traverse the like get parent mm -hmm. uh, and you, you said you get less information, how is that actually, how is that built? You get a, like a, some sort of proxy object? Because I would assume if you get parent, you, you, would get, you would expect the render frame object to return. Would so you get something a, else instead? Yeah, so this is why out of process iframes were hard. Um, and I would ask this question tomorrow in the security talk. Okay. Um, when they start talking about it's talking about site isolation out of process iframes, uh, because yes, a lot of the APIs really were built with the assumption that you could get information about all the frames associated with a single like doc like parent doc like main document in the same process, and separating that out into multiple processes made it substantially more complicated.